Well, good morning. Good to see each of you and to hear the noise of the crowd, to hear the, uh, the buzz on Sunday morning is a beautiful thing. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're excited that you've come our way. Uh, whether you're passing through or just moved into the area, we want to encourage you to fill out a visitor's card. They're on the back of the pew in front of you. You can stick it, on, stick it in one of the collection boxes in the back or just leave it on the seat and we'll grab it up from there. Uh, if you're visiting with us and you have kids, we want to make you aware we have a nursery back over here that's actually under construction, so good luck. Uh, we have children's Bible time um, in the song before the lesson. We'll stand up and sing, and, and some of our kids will head off that way. You can, you can be a part of that with your kids. And then we also have a training room back there in the back. I um, want to make an announcement real quick before we pray and begin our service uh, that Jim and Kim Woods have asked to be members of the body here. And I'm going to ask them to stand real quick so you can put your eyes on them. It's Jim and Kim Woods, so good to have you guys with us. Before we begin our worship, would you bow with me? Almighty God, we're, uh, we're such a blessed people, and, and you tell us in your word where two or more are gathered together, there you will be. Uh, how much of a blessing that is that, that you are here, and we're blessed to be in your presence, Lord, and it's at this time that we begin our worship to you. We pray that uh, we'd get rid of all the outside noise, all these other things that are on our minds and on our hearts, uh, whether they're good things or bad, Lord, we pray that uh, for just a little while here, we lay those things to the side and worship you and give you all that we have. Lord, we love you and thank you for all that you do for us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let us worship. Good morning. Glad we can be together this morning. What a blessing it is. As I was putting these songs together, I was asking myself, why do we sing? How do we sing? And Psalm 13, for some reason, came to mind. And Psalm 13 is, is what we often refer to as a lament song. What starts off as a dreadful, bleak picture. David asked the question, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Will my enemies always be exalted over me? And it's just a, a six-verse psalm, but it ends with a, on a high point. And David's understanding is, since God has been good to me, I will sing to him. And what an appropriate response it is for us. Since God has been good to us, we will sing to him. We've all been through what David is talking about. We've had dreadful times times that we felt where God had abandoned us how, how long is this going to happen but God always takes after and looks after his children and what a blessing it is to be able to sing together so we try to get some songs along the thoughts of uh, blessing hope a living hope togetherness things of that nature thank you for being here oh thou found of every blessing
Before our prayer this morning, we'll sing our fellowship. Let's go to our Father in prayer. O oh God, as we come before thy throne this morning, we recognize you as the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and the Great I Am. We're so blessed to be your children, and for all the blessings that you give us each and every day, we especially are grateful for your love and your grace and your mercy. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that we need you each day. We need your Son and his redeeming blood in our life. We need the Holy Spirit in our life to guide us in the pathway of truth through your word. And we're thankful, O oh Lord, that we can come before you and get forgiveness of our sins if we'll just repent. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless our effort here to evangelize Ocala, evangelize those that we support in other countries, that your church and your kingdom will grow. We recognize that we fall short of your glory and we ask forgiveness again because sin is sometimes so prevalent in our life and we need to be penitent, repentant. Thank you for the elders that we have here. Be with Jody as he goes through this process of being appointed an elder. We look forward to him serving. We look forward to his vision and look forward to the work that he'll do with the other elders. We're grateful for their families and their desire to serve you and to serve this church. Be with us through this worship. May it be in, may we lift our voices in song and praise you and glorify you by the things that we say and do. In Christ's holy name, 
Amen. Before we take the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing the breaking of bread to help us focus our minds and the thoughts of Jesus and what he has done for us. The breaking of bread. If you need a cup, please raise your hand and we'll bring one to you. Our focus verse, verse is, this morning, come from the book of Titus, chapter 2, and verses 11 through 14. The book of Titus was written by Paul to the young preacher, Titus, on the island of Crete. And it's not a very long letter. But it's an important letter as far as how the church is to look. In the first chapter, he talks about appointing elders, and he talks about the task of the elders. In the second chapter, he talks about the qualities of the church, what a church should look like. And starting at verse 11, he gives the reason for all this. And I will start there. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Notice there he starts out with talking about the grace of God that brings salvation to all men. It's available to everyone. And it teaches us, this grace teaches us that we should deny those things in the world that are ungodly, that we should stay away from those things and that we should live, as he says, soberly. We should live seriously. We should live a life that is good and glorifies his name for all this he has done for us. 
And then we are also looking for that time when Jesus is going to come again and we will be able to be with him in eternity. And he goes on to say that it's just this Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. He died on that cross for each one of us to purify us from those lawless things, those sins we have that so stains our lives, but that we should be purified. He says, for his own special people. Now, we're not special in that we're better than everybody else. We're special because he has saved us, because we have obeyed him and we're living for him. And then he finishes that by saying, zealous for good works. We've been talking about that a lot during this past month, about being zealous for good works. The main thing I want us to see is, and at this time, is that Jesus died on that cross for each one of us. And we have the opportunity now to remember that sacrifice that he made for us. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all you do for us, for all you've given to us. But especially, Father, at this time, we thank you for Jesus, for his willingness to come down from that cross that glory in heaven with you, to suffer on the earth like one of us, but yet be without sin. And then on our behalf, Father, to give himself on that cross. We thank you so much, Father, that uh, for this sacrifice, as we partake now of this bread, which, which is representative of his body that hung on that cross, we pray that you will be with us, help us to dwell on the significance of that sacrifice and help us always be more like him. In his name we pray, amen. Hold up that little cup. It almost looks like blood. Jesus used the fruit of the vine to represent that blood which he was going to shed on our behalf. As we know, without blood there is no life. Life is in the blood. So let's be thankful for what he has done for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again, for all you have done for us and all that Jesus has done for us on that cross. Today, Father, as we have looked at this fruit of the vine, which so represents that blood which Jesus shed, be with us, help us to, again, realize the significance of that and of what he has done for us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
At this time, we also have an opportunity to express to the Lord our love for him and what he has done for us and what he has given us. Look around, as, as you all know, we're the most blessed country in this world. We have the freedoms we have, we have the ability to go out and earn a living, express our ideas. We just are so blessed. But with that blessing comes responsibility also, because he's given us the responsibility to spread the word wherever we can. And so at this time, we have an opportunity to give back to him so that that we can help that take place, spreading his word and take care of the other, the other things that we need to do here at this congregation. As you know, there are a couple boxes in the back along the wall. You can put your contributions there. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you so much for all the physical things you've given to us, for all the physical blessings of, of life, of health, and of the ability to uh, earn a living. We pray, Father, that you will help us realize again that all this comes from you, and it's all because of your blessings. And we pray, Father, that you will help us use these things which you have given us to your honor and your glory. Help us now as we give back monetarily to your service, but help us not deny, Father, our duty to be about your work in every phase of our life. Help us, Father, always again to be more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. If you can, let us stand as we sing this song, The Solid Rock. After this song, we'll have our lesson, and we're probably going to pick the tempo up just a little bit. We're talking about hope and salvation and eternity, but something to get excited about and something to sing out about. and the Fred Hayes Show. I'd say that was a pretty successful broadcast. Thank you very much, Thank you Houston. Very much, Houston. Uh, we got a couple of housekeeping procedures for you. We'd like you to roll right to zero, six, zero, and null your rates. Roger that, rolling right, zero, six, zero. And then if you could uh, give your oxygen tanks a stir. Roger that.
problem here. What did you do? Nothing. I stirred the tanks. Whoa. Hey. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. We have a main bus B undervolt. We've got a lot of thruster What's activity here, Houston. Now? It just went offline. Oh, there's another master alarm, Houston. I'm checking a quad. Christ, there's no repress valve. Maybe it's in quad. We've got a computer restart. I'm going to reconfigure the RCS. We've got a big light. Fire, it doesn't make any sense. We've got multiple caution and warning, Houston. We've got a reset and restart. All right, I'm going to SCS. On April the 11th, 1970, these three men took off from Cape Kennedy. And 56 hours later, what was depicted in the Tom Hanks movie occurred. They were over 200,000 miles from Earth and were hurling through space at unbelievable speed and what seemed to be out of control. To the watching world, their situation was bleak and bordering on hopelessness. There was an abject fear. It became a newsreel before 24-hour news, if you remember and lived at that time. Their situation looked entirely hopeless. Um, how are they going to get back to earth? Would they ever make it back to earth? Of course, history tells us that three days later they did safely splash down. And in interviews afterward, these three men said, we had no idea that the world was watching to the extent that it was. Uh, they knew their situation was bleak, but according to the interviews, they said it never felt hopeless to us. But to those who lived here on this earth and were completely unschooled and untrained in abject fear of consequences and things happening out of their control, it's hard for us to imagine what that was like. But you know, life often throws things at us that we just cannot expect. Am I right? It happens when you least expect it. You get a phone call, you get a letter attached to your check at work, you get a knock at the door. And suddenly your world that was seemingly going along okay, now you're faced with this moment of what appears to be or could appear to be hopeless. With that in mind, I invite you to take your Bibles and open with me to Acts chapter 27. In the 27th chapter of the book of Acts, I'm going to be reading beginning at verse 13. It says, When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor, and they sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a nor'easter burst across the island and blew us out to sea. And the sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and they let it run with the gale. We sailed along the sheltered side of a small island called Cauda, where with great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across the sandbars of the Sirtis off the African coast. So they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, verse 18, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, 
The crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. These are experienced mariners. They've seen storms before, they've ridden through rains before and winds before, but this storm is of such a ferocious nature that they feel like there's not a, we don't have a chance. All hope is gone. Verse 21, the first part says, And no one had eaten for a long time. <laughs> you know, when hopelessness sets in, there is a checking out of our other normal body functions many times. The desire to eat is not there. The fear of what's going to happen next, what's, a, what's occurring right in front of their eyes... He goes on to say at verse 21, Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this danger and loss. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For, the last, for last night an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood before me and he said, Don't be afraid, Paul. For you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in His goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as He said. But we will be shipwrecked on an island. In the midst of this hopelessness, Paul says, God spoke to me last night. God told me that things will be different, that, that, that there's going to be a shipwreck, but we're going to make it out. And, and I believe God, so take courage. Look at verse 33. Just as the day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You've been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please, eat something now for your own good, for not a hair of your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke it off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat. All 276 of us who were on board, after eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. And when morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get to shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors, they left them in the sea, then they lowered the rudders, raised the foresail, and headed toward the shore. But they hit a shoal, and they ran the ship aground too soon. And the bow of the ship began, was struck fast, and the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves, and it began to break apart. And the soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. And then the others held on to planks and debris from the boat broken ship. So everyone escaped safely to shore. There are two powerful phrases in that reading. The first one is found in verse 20, and it simply says that all hope was gone. As I said, hopelessness is a feeling of desperation. It's, it's feeling like you have an incapability of finding a solution for the situation. You have no expectation of good success. There is a certain despair and a susceptibility to, to the idea of negative that there is no cure, there is no remedy, nothing will change. 
It's hard, in fact, when one is dealing with hopelessness to even perform regular mundane tasks. A life without hope is void of good. It has a bleak outcast. It feels great stress and difficulty. At worst, it can even lead to feelings of abject emptiness and even suicide. These sailors, these experienced mariners and passengers who are on this boat felt the weight of the dire circumstances that they were in. All hope was gone. But you know the real question is not those guys or the men who were on Apollo 13. The real question is, have you felt moments of hopelessness? You felt like that's it. There, there's no other answer. It couldn't be any worse. Life has thrown some things at you. Life has picked some of you up and body slammed some of you. Hasn't it? I think it has. Life has beat you up and bludgeoned many of you, harassed you. And sometimes the feeling is, I just can't take anymore. That's, that's as far as I can go. But maybe that's not you. Maybe life hasn't been so harsh or so cruel. But this I do know that the Satan has been fighting you. And the Satan has done everything he can. And he's won with you on different occasions. He's gotten you to fall flat on your face. He's pierced you through with his arrows. And he's laughed in your face when you were down and out. So what do you do when you feel this sense of abject hopelessness? It's the next phrase where Paul says, take courage, for I believe God. Take courage. Paul told them, take courage. Why? Why should these experienced mariners, these men who knew the sea, who knew the storms, who knew the winds, why should they take courage when they had lost all hope? Because God had entered the picture. And when God enters the picture, everything changes. When God enters the picture. I want to suggest to you, we need to have today, we need to have this kind of courageous hope. This hope that, like Paul says, take courage, for I believe God. That, that we need to have this kind of courageous hope that anchors and directs our lives. Like I said in the beginning, life has a way of throwing things at us. And what the Bible is telling us is, take hope, be courageous, I believe God. Now, I, I don't want to suggest that everything's going to work out perfectly for you. That would not be intellectually honest or biblically accurate. Sometimes... When we fear the worst, the worst does happen. Sometimes the relationship explodes. Sometimes that the news that the doctor gave us is accurate. Sometimes the check doesn't come that was promised to come. Sometimes the news is devastating. But I want to submit to you as well that when God enters the picture, everything changes. It's the same answer. Turn with me 
to Psalm 107. Jeffrey started us out by talking about a a psalm much earlier, Psalm 13. This is a much longer psalm. I want to read some verses from this psalm and, and, and hopefully make this be something that becomes very real and special to you. Not because I'm reading it, but because God has said it. Psalm 107. I'm going to read reading out of the NLT. Beginning at verse, uh, we'll begin up at verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others that He's redeemed you from your enemies. For He has gathered the exiles from many lands, from the east and the west, from the north and from the south. Now listen at verse 4. Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless, hungry and thirsty. They nearly died. Lord, help us, they cried out in their trouble. And He rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. Drop down to verse 10. Some sat in darkness, in the deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. They rebelled against the words of God, scorning the counsel of the Most High. That's why He broke them with hard labor. They fell, and no one was there to help them. Lord, help, they cried. And He saved them from their distress, and He led them from the darkest darkness and deepest gloom, and He snapped their chains. Look down at verse 20, or excuse me, 17. Some were fools. They rebelled and suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food, and they were knocking at death's door. Lord, help, they cried out in their trouble, and He saved them from their distress. He sent out His Word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. And drop down to verse 25, or verse 23. Some went off to, this, off to sea in ships, plying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, His impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths, and the sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were all at their wits' end. Lord, help! They cried in their trouble, and He saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. All these people in different situations, and the answer still is, when God enters the picture, Everything changes. You see, they they cried, Lord, help us, and God rescued them. Lord, help us, and God rescues them. Lord, help us, and God rescues them. Over and over again. When we feel like things are hopeless, take courage. I believe God. And when God enters the picture, everything changes. It takes courage to do this. It takes courageous hope. It's a lot easier just to fold under pressure. It's a lot easier to just give in, to give up, to fold our tents and go home because That's just the way it is. It's a lot harder. It's a lot more difficult. It's a lot more challenging to stand up and to hold on in the times of despair. What if those three astronauts on Apollo 13 had said, well, we can't make it. That's it. That's over. It's done. You know, it was rumored for a long time that that the astronauts carried suicide pills with them in their uniforms. 
I guess in case they were abducted by aliens or something. I don't know what the re- But then they carried suicide pills with them. And they were interviewed over and over and over and over and over through the years afterwards. And one of the three men, I don't remember which, they said, we didn't need a suicide pill. All we'd have to do is open the vent to outside. That would take care of it. What if they had done that? What if they just gave up all hope? What if they said, there's nothing can be done, this can't be fixed, it can't be remedied? What if the people in Houston had said, well, we're sorry, you're on your own. Hope we can find a way back on those 205,000 miles. But they didn't. Because courageous hope was evident even with them. I don't know how many of them, if any, were believers and God-fearing people. Let me share with you five characteristics of what courageous hope looks like, because this is really the challenging part of it. It, it, It's easy, I, I just have to tell you, it's easy to stand up here and say it. It, it's, it's easy to say, just you need to have hope. You need to have courageous hope. But let me tell you what courageous hope looks like. First of all, courageous hope is trusting. Although it may seem counterintuitive in the moment, that when everything seems to be falling apart, the relationship has gone south, the, the job is no more, the health is not what it was, whatever the situation that courageous hope is trusting. It trusts in God. It trusts in God's Word. It trusts in God's promises. Psalm 56, beginning at verse 1, says, O God, have mercy on me, for people are hounding me. My foes attack me all day long. I'm constantly hounded by those who slander me, and many are boldly attacking me. But when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what He has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? It may be counterintuitive, and it may be the hardest thing you've ever done. But courageous hope, trust in God. Secondly, courageous hope is is waiting. This may be the hardest thing. Depends on the person. To have courageous hope, you have to wait. Sometimes wait a lot longer than you ever wanted to wait. When you thought the answer would be quick, when you thought, surely this is the answer, surely this is the end, surely this is the bottom, we can't go any further. And you wait for that day to come, and you find yourself three floors lower than you were yesterday. Waiting is hard. I think about the difficulty that would have been involved. I, 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 can't, I can't even imagine it. When God told Abraham to take his son up on the mountain and kill him. And gut him and light him on fire. That's what a human sacrifice would have been. And Abraham trusts God. And he and the boy begin this journey to the mountain. I want to ask you, if God forbid, but if you were ever put in a situation like that, how fast would you be walking? Yeah, not very fast. Every, every minute that passed would have seemed like an hour. And every hour that passed would have seemed like five seconds in some ways. 
as you made your walk and your son says, hey, dad, I see the wood and I see the fire. Where's the sacrifice? <laughs> I, I can't imagine that. It wouldn't be a lump in your throat. It would just be uh, the weight of the world. In Hebrews, the sixth chapter, we're given a little picture of this. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 13, for example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in His own name, saying, I will certainly bless you, and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. And Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. We sometimes take this verse out of its context and say, well, Abraham had to wait a long time for children. That's not the context here. The context is when Abraham was told to go offer his son Isaac on the altar, and when God stayed Abraham's hand before he plunged that knife into his son, that's when God said, I will certainly bless you, and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. And Abraham waited patiently. How hard would that have been? Courageous faith is, it waits. Are you waiting for something right now? Maybe you're waiting for it to be 11 o'clock or me to be done. I hope that's not what's on your mind. But are you waiting for some medical tests right now? Are you waiting for a pregnancy to occur? Are you waiting for a marriage to be salvaged? Waiting is tough. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 14 says, Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Thirdly, courageous faith is seeing. It's in the midst of trying times and in the darkness that we sometimes find ourselves is to see the light of what God has offered to us. Those with courageous hope, they see a brighter day. They see a happier outcome. They see a reckoning by God and that they will have the strength and the wherewithal to be able to deal with whatever comes in their way. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 16, that's why we never give up, Paul says. Though our outward bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small, and they won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So, don't look at the troubles that we see now. Rather, fix our gaze on that which we cannot see. For the things that we see now are soon to be gone, but those things that we cannot see will last forever. Fourthly, courageous hope is expecting. Courageous hope doesn't just sit back in quiet resignation and wait for life to happen and whatever is going to occur in life to happen, there's actually contained within it an active defiance. Hope is defiant. It says, I, I, I know this is what the world says. I know this is what this happened. I know this is what this is. But I believe God, and so I can take courage. And there is a hopeful expectation, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things that we cannot see. 
And finally, I want to suggest to you that courageous hope is contagious. All of us have been around somebody at work or in our family or in the church or in our uh, homes, whatever it is, that, that they're so discouraged and they're so down. And you know how that just weighs everybody down. You come into the office, oh no, she's here today. <laughs> and you just kind of feel like a weight's been set on your shoulder. Oh no, I'm going to have to deal with him today. But courageous hope is also contagious. It's infectious. When you have a bright outlook, when you have an expectancy and a hope to see things to be different because you believe God, because you trust God, you put your hope in God, that as well as contagious. We've been talking about being evangelistic, having that kind of bright outlook on life, this bright hopeful look on life as a way to reach and to teach others. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 1, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Now, in the light of this, Paul is in prison. He said, I want you to know that me being here has actually worked out to the spread of the gospel. Verse 13, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers have gained confidence. And they boldly speak God's message without fear. Because you see, courageous hope is contagious. And so I close with this. Courageous hope is never easy. But when God enters the picture, everything changes. Because God is who He is, and because Jesus has paved the way, we can have this same kind of courageous hope. Not because of who we are, not because of what we've done but because of who God is and because what Jesus has done for us. I want to invite you today to have that kind of courageous hope in your life. Friends, if you're not a Christian, I can't give you a reason as to why you wouldn't change that today. Your soul is in jeopardy. You're headed for an eternal hell separated from God forever. And God's already paid the price. He gave His Son to die for you. If you believe that, and you're willing to put your life in God's hands then you can have the forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed. You can have heaven as your home. And you can courageously walk out of this building today with a hope that anchors every moment of your life. If you need to come back and we pray for you and with you, let us know how we can serve while we together stand and we're going to sing this song.
First of all, our assistance for the Colonel Colony is in Advent Hospital for more tests. We have those tomorrow. So uh, please keep doing your prayers. They ask no visitors at the present time. Uh, I have an update on a, a child by the name of Sawyer. This is a little boy at Carly Moore's. Uh, who's the babysitter? And she says the pathology reports came back cancerous. thankful for the grace that we have through your word, the grace that gives us that hope of heaven, and 
And we do not deserve that, but Father, you give it to us so freely. Father, we're thankful for that forgiveness of sins we have through that great sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross of Calvary. Father, we're mindful of the lost. We're mindful of the condition they're in. And Father, we pray that they will see the hope and that they'll have that faith and they'll have that courage and that they will allow you into, your, into their life and come to know you before it's ever too late. We're so grateful for Brother Jody and, and the Yanceys and so many others that preach and teach your word and do such a wonderful job. We're so thankful to have that much talent here. Father, we pray that you'll be with each one of them as they uh, in, endeavor in the efforts to grow your kingdom. I pray that you'll bless them. Father, we are so thankful for the visitors that we have here with us today. We pray that they'll be able to come back and visit with us again and enjoy the love and unity and the friendship that resides here in this congregation. We pray that as they do, if they are traveling on, we pray that they have a safe journey to their, uh, their next destination. Father, we are mindful of those who may be sick and we pray that the medical means being used on them will return them back to a better health and that they may be back to join with us again. Father, we pray that each, each of us will allow God into our life and uh, allow us, help us to live each and every day for you and encourage others as we can to know you and to uh, have you in their life. Father, we pray we are about to leave this building. Pray that you'll continue to watch over and guide us, that you'll bless us with those things you know we need. We're so thankful for your love and we're thankful for your son and that sacrifice that he made. We do pray for forgiveness as we fail you from time to time. We pray that you'll be with us until we meet again. For this our prayer in Jesus' holy name.